Hi, everyone. This is Barb Kulora, the President and CEO for Resolve, the National Infertility Association. I am so honored today to welcome actress and Resolve Ambassador Elizabeth Rome to the Resolve community and really to have this chance to talk with her one-on-one. -on -one. Elizabeth, hello. Thank you for taking hello. the time to talk with me today. I'm so happy to be embraced by you guys and to, to be a part of the community. Thank you. Well, I want, for our listeners today who do not know, I want them to know about your recently released book about your infertility story. It's titled Baby Steps, Having the Child I Always Wanted, Just Not As I Expected. Um, I want to find out a little bit about why you wanted to share your story in, in a book in such a public way. At first, when I went through my process of struggling with infertility, it wasn't that I made a conscious decision to be ashamed of not being able to do what you know you expect you'll be able to do naturally. It just was a painful thing we were going through as a family, and I tend to be a private person. And Again, you know, one of the things I've really analyzed over the years since these things have been growing and as I've wanted to speak about this is the difference between secrecy and privacy. Privacy is important, but when there is a chance to create a movement, a higher consciousness and an awareness around a subject that, you know, for the most part, I'm not saying completely or entirely, and I'm not taking away from all the people who've spoken out publicly, um, from public figures to you know, you know, not public figures, people who come together in communities to really be vocal about this subject. I'm not saying that we haven't made some really big strides, but we're at a time where it's the wild west of infertility. There's still so much that we can, you know, get behind in regards to progress, in regards to um, support from the community at large, from, you know, medical support to just uh, emotionally not feeling like we're the, you know, the broken ones, we're the women who can't have children, or, or the men that can't have children. And I just felt like as time went by that, you know, I, by keeping it to myself, it was a sin of omission. And I went through a process with a family member of, of mine who decided to tell our family about the struggle she was having to have children. She had multiple miscarriages. I talk about it in my book. And for me, she was, you know, a tipping point into my becoming very open with her about having done IVF. She was celebrating my having my daughter. And she said, oh, it's so great you have a daughter. I'm trying so hard, and I just keep having miscarriage after miscarriage. And I looked at her, and I said, I did IVF. I, I didn't have her naturally. It was a struggle, and we started to talk about it, and it was very cathartic for us. And we began to realize that together, by speaking out about the subject, that we could be supportive for one another and healing for one another. And that became a greater, greater concern of mine than keeping it to myself. And then I ended up blogging about it on my blog for people.com, and again, I saw this need for women to start speaking out about it in a way that, you know, released the stigma and the taboo of saying I had to do IVF, I needed to get a surrogate, I needed to get an egg donor, whatever your journey is, there's nothing wrong with it. If you want to be a mother, if you want to have a family, you have the right to have a family. And we have to support each other in however that comes together. Absolutely, and what a great message. And I love how you distinguish between privacy and secrecy and the fact that you are in the public eye and you have a platform, it's so amazing that you recognize that difference and realize how important this is going to be. As I say all the time, if we all stay silent, we're never going to see any progress. We're starting to hear a lot from people who say, I want something different for my children. I want this to be completely open. I want them to have better information, and better resources. And if I don't say something, nothing's going to change for my daughter or my son. So thank you for that. Um, we asked our Facebook community um, if they had any questions for you, and so I was wondering if I could ask, pass on a couple of these questions to you. Sure. The first one was, somebody wrote, how did you get through those times when you felt like giving up? What made you continue on? Well, I'll say two things. One is, I was lucky that I was able to pay for IVF. That is something I don't feel um, 
everybody has the ability to do without getting into major financial, you know, disrepair yep. or, you know. And so I didn't have that additional burden of feeling like, oh, God, I can't do it one more time, you know, financially. Um, and I also was lucky enough to have early detection, which is why one of my messages in the book, I feel like, is to really encourage women in their 30s to start checking their ovarian reserve and their hormone levels so that like, they have, you know, accelerated ovarian aging or any complications in regards to natural conception, you know, that they have their youth on their side. And so that's just to say that I don't know if I had or I know I didn't have as a difficult of a situation as some other people. So I think that I was very lucky that my situation, you know, it didn't require seven rounds of IVF. I didn't just have two eggs. Now, I had some painful things occur, like I had a collapsed um, ovary on my left side, and I also um, only produced eight eggs, and I did two cycles of IVF treatment. So there were ups and downs for a good couple of months, but it only took a couple of months, so I don't, I don't want to take away from everybody else out there who's having a much harder time than I did that I, you know, I, I, all I know is that, you know, you have the right to be a mother, you have the right to have a family, and I know how painful this is, and we have to just turn to one another, and hopefully what helps you to carry on, you know, is the healing in community. You know, you just, that, you know, you're not alone, and even if you had a vision of your future and your future family that looked one way and it's another way, that, that doesn't make you, you know, a freak or wrong or broken. It's just, you know, you having to come to terms with a different, you know, a different story in your life. And I know that that doesn't really give enough, you know, healing, you know, just to say that, but I... I do think that in having my cousin and then, you know, being able to be there for a few friends who've had fertility issues, you know, since then and to come out with the book and just to become a part of the community through writing about it on my blog, I've had healing again and again through mm -hmm. sharing the experience with others. So I don't know what everyone's destiny is, but I do know that together, you know, we can love one another and, and hold each other up during times of pain. Well, thank you for that. That was amazing. One more question from our Facebook community. Do you think the media can play a role in reducing the stigma around this disease? Absolutely. And I think that, again, that goes to why I think public figures especially, although I do understand the dilemma, you know, you want to have some part of your life be sacred and your family is sacred. You don't want to parade your kids around you know, publicly and you try to keep your relationship private, you know, I'm saying like a vast majority of actors and singers that I know are able to find that balance. But if you have suffered fertility issues, if you can speak out, if the media can support this and make this a subject that, you know, we collectively as a, as a society are, are wanting to talk about, then we have a greater chance of, of changing, um, you know, insurance, policies and, you know, just the point of view on women have the right to do what they want to do with their bodies. People have the right to make choices for themselves. And we yeah. want to really yeah. Im impress that into the consciousness of society. And, and you know, one of the things that Dr. Sahaki and my, you know, my fertility doctor said to me is he said, so many people come through the back doorway at the back stairwell oh, into, one of the, in, into one of the, you know, you know, um, waiting, you know, into one of his medical rooms because they, you know, whether it's their religious beliefs, where they're from, you know, geographically, what their nationality is, what, you know, what their, you know, there are various reasons why they don't want anyone to know. That to me is, is not a higher consciousness about a subject that should just be accepted. If you have fertility issues, you have a disease. So let's handle it. And allow and, and support that woman or that man to have the family that they deserve through medical advancement. It's really simple. Absolutely. There shouldn't be this need to sneak up the back, you know, staircase because, you know, you're afraid that, you know, uh, your community is not going to accept you because you weren't able to conceive 
in the good old fashioned way. It is it is amazing the stigma that is still so attached to this. Well, I um, we loved your book, and you have a paragraph in your book that just completely spoke to all of us on the staff of Resolve, and I'm sure anybody connected with Resolve who's read your book probably felt the exact same way. If it's okay, I want to go ahead and read this out loud, this paragraph, and then talk to you about it. Imagine a day when all women who have experienced fertility problems can stand together, raising funds and awareness and changing lives. Imagine a day when choosing to do IVF could be celebrated. Well, Elizabeth, this is what we do every single day at Resolve. What we are absolutely working towards is that day that you are, are stating, imagine this day. First of all, thank you so much for writing that. It was beautiful. It was exactly spot on to what we believe and think. So what was your motivation behind this, what we think is just an amazing thought? Because I celebrate my daughter every day. Because I look at her and she is a miracle. And all children are miracles. But, but the children who, you know, come onto this earth through, you know, the, you know, these incredible miracles of science, you know, should be celebrated. It is a miracle that Easton exists. And I feel very, very strongly that we are so blessed as a society that we have these options that, that you know, we do keep advancing, that I want more advancement. I want more and more advancement. I want there to be a time when we look at fertility issues like, you know, the way that we look at breast cancer now. I want that, you know, we as a community come together and become advocates for women like we have done with breast cancer. And that means the men and the women coming together and celebrating these, these you know, miracles of science that allow us to have the children that we've always wanted and to, to, to have love and to, and to give love and receive it through our children and through our families and through community. So I'm, I, don't, I'm, I want to get to a place where there's a lack of judgment and more celebrating of life. And that's what I'm, you know, hopeful for. Well, and let's face it, we all know that the breast cancer movement was much stigmatized 25, 30 years ago when it really formed and came together. I hope we certainly don't have to wait 25, 30 years for the infertility community to feel that, that um, lessening of stigma. And books like yours and Speaking Out certainly go a long way. But um, we just uh, stand with you. We believe in this phrase that you have, this paragraph that you've put in your book, and I hope everybody listening to this can also imagine that day. Um, Elizabeth, we are so proud to share that this fall, Resolve is going to be hosting our first annual California Walk of Hopes. We're actually doing two in California. And our shared vision, I mean, can you imagine of people standing together, walking together, raising funds and awareness is really becoming a reality in many places across the country. So our question to you is, what does that phrase, infertility movement, really mean to you? I think that when you're at the precipice of change, you have to create a movement. And that means that even if you don't want to be vocal, you have to be because there's an urgency and the time is now because we are at a place where things have not evolved enough, and it is urgent. It's an urgent yep. issue. And because of the urgency, I urge every public figure who's done IVF or had, you know, the privilege of, you know, having a fertility expert help them with their, their family, whether they've used a surrogate or an egg donor or they've done IUI, whatever it is, whatever your story is, to speak out about it and come together in unity so that we can make a movement. And the movement is what will create change, lasting change. Well, we couldn't agree with you more. And I do agree with you completely that there's an urgency. Just not enough has been done, and we just we can't wait any longer. So we are really honored that we can call you a friend and a Resolve ambassador. And I'd like to know how Resolve helped you on your own journey. 
Well, I get asked frequently, well, now, recently, since the book has come out, what I can say to somebody who is going through it. How can I encourage them? And again, you know, I falter to, you know, have all the words of compassion and love and reach through the telephone line or the radio lines and, you know, wrap my arms around somebody who's suffering and wants a family desperately and isn't sure it's ever going to happen. But I do believe that with Resolve, you know, you have a community and you have you know, a family there of support, and you have to just reach into it, accept it, and let it, you know, help you in your journey. And I and I feel that feeling towards you guys, and I'm very grateful to have the relationship. Thank you so much for that. Um, what has been the reaction that you've received from your fans or even your Hollywood peers about sharing your infertility story so beautifully but also boldly in your book? You know, it's been really amazing to see how many people have decided to come out to me about having done fertility treatments successfully or unsuccessfully who've reached out to me to share their story. Every single talk show I've gone on, you know, every place that I've done an interview, one of the producers or somebody involved with the show says, I have an IVF baby and shows me a picture. Or has some story that they want to share of what they're going through, and I've been able to connect them to Dr. Sahakian or some other fertility experts and given them my email. And so in a way, you know, I think it's been, again, I think the book is about a lot of other things besides fertility issues, and I hope that people who are going through fertility issues don't expect that if they read my book, it's going to tell you everything about fertility issues. But I do think by writing a book about fertility, it has opened me up to be, Um, available to people who are going through the experience and if I can ever be of help I want to be and if I can ever connect them to somebody in the community like Resolve or like Dr. Sahakian and I can give a woman a hand during her journey then it's a privilege and I feel very very honored that women reached out to me since I wrote the book. and, And we have the same experience when you start talking about your infertility, um, your inter- I, I, I'm interviewed a lot and talk to people, and then as soon as the tape recorder shuts off or the TV camera turns away, the person says, let me tell you my story, or mm-hmm. we've gone through this. We just finished our Federal Advocacy Day here in Washington, D.C., and we had advocates meeting with their members of Congress and their staff, and at the end of the day, we had so many of our volunteers say, wow. I was sitting there talking to a staffer, and they said, I've gone through infertility. Oh, my goodness, can you help me? And it happened over and over and over that day. So we just need to be out there talking more, sharing more, doing just what you're doing. What an inspiration, Elizabeth. We um, are so grateful for you. Um, I am honored to have you as part of this community and to be able to have this time to talk to you. Your book, Baby Steps, is available now. And can you let people know how they can find it? It's available at Amazon, which is probably the easiest, or, you know, Barnes & Noble or Books a Million. Uh, My website is elizabeth-rome, E-L-I-S-A-B-T-H-R-O-H-M, and you can click on any one of those icons, Books a Million or Amazon. But it is also in all of, I would say, you know, most Barnes & Noble throughout the country. So I hope people will pick it up and be in touch and email me on my website and let me know what's going on with them. And also follow you on your people.com blog, which has been so fantastic and has had such a following. And I know in the, in the print magazine, they're really promoting it as well. So thank you for continuing to do that and reach people in so many different ways. Well, thank you again, Elizabeth. Um, we enjoy talking with you, and I know that your story is going to touch so many lives and make a real difference. So thank you. Thank you, too.